All right. Today is Monday, February 21st. This is a recap for the stock market activities last week and the outlook for the week to come. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And let's start by this. We're all on pins and needles waiting and waiting and waiting. Whether the tyrant is going to invade or will he be just satisfied after recapturing Ottawa? Anyways, happy President's Day. Hope you enjoyed the long weekend holiday. Of course, in this day, we remember the sacrifices, most importantly, the courage that the Founding Fathers had to liberate us from the British. Otherwise, we could be living under Great Britain right now and enjoying free health care. <laughs> Folks, I can crack jokes all day long, but we have a lot to talk about and we're running out of time already. So let's dive right into it. And here it is. In focus tonight. Let's talk about the Russia-Ukraine tensions and the impacts on inflation specifically. And then let's talk about not inflation, but stagflation. We have a call from Mohamed al -Arian. And lastly, what about the Fed and their policy updates? We start with the Russia-Ukraine tensions, of course... Every day, every minute, we get a different story. On Friday, we heard the news that perhaps the Russians are pulling back. We saw pictures and videos of tanks being moved off the border. Everybody said, okay, perhaps we're seeing the tensions easing. The stock market is moving higher. And then comes the Biden administration with the announcement that the Russians are about to invade once again. Remember, it was February 16th, imminently, and that didn't happen. Then Joe Biden came out on Friday and said it's going to happen. Believe me. And the stock market went down. Futures were crashing. You know the story. And then yesterday, overnight, we got another piece of news that French President Macaroni came up with a deal, in principle at least, between Putin and Biden, that they're going to meet in a summit and what do you know, the futures popped higher again. Now, I told you that President Macaroni is a liar. He wants to be a peacemaker. He's irrelevant to begin with, but somehow he wants to be irrelevant. All due respect, of course, to the French people and the country of France. But your boy is uh, irrelevant. Nobody cares about him at all. Matter of fact, Putin said that he only cares about Germany. That is the only opinion that matters for him. So if there is anybody who is going to broker a peace deal right now, it's going to be Germany, not President Macaroni. And what do you know? Then we got the news today that Putin is announcing something and futures went down again and it appears that the stock market will open down big right off the gate tomorrow. And the whole thing, by the way, remains mysterious and a lot of questions are being asked. For example, who built the table, the long table that Putin has been meeting Macaroni and the German Chancellor and other presidents? But somehow, when Bolsonaro the Brazilian president, when he visited Moscow, he did not get the long table treatment. Matter of fact, Putin shook his hand, kisses, hugs, no problems at all. So who knows what's going on here. But we have a new warning from RBC that the Russia-Ukraine war could drop stocks another 20%. So run for the hills, run for the hills. But before you run for the hills, we have another call from BMO who say, you know what, calm down, the S&P 500 will surge 20% by year end. And don't worry about recession, all of these fears are overblown. So who do you believe, what garbage do you go with? I tell you what, right now, there are winners either way. And these winners are the military industrial complex, the defense contractors. They just got a big deal, a $6 billion worth of deal with Poland. But we're going to get more deals here. With all of these threats and wars looming, wars coming, you're going to see more and more deals. Last week, we got the $16 billion deal with Indonesia. So you might want to stick with defense contractors here. Lockheed, General Dynamics, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, or Grumman, whatever the hell it is. Doesn't matter to me, so long as it prints. But we have a dire warning here from economist Mohamed al -Arian, who says that the Russian invasion of Ukraine could trigger a stagflationary wind. Take a listen. I do want to pick up on that, but first follow up on the first comment you made about uh, Russia-Ukraine maybe presenting a stagflationary threat to the markets. We've seen the effect that we on oil prices, right, pushing oil prices up because of concerns about supply. Is that your primary concern here regarding that and then the knock-on effects of that, or are there other elements that we should be considering? So it's more than oil. Um, if you look at Russia and Ukraine, they are major exporters of a number of commodities. And if, there, if a conflict were 
to break out a military conflict, then you would have sanctions that would limit exports from Russia, and you would have disruptions in Ukraine. So the first element is simply a big cost push. And of course, as you can see, the commodity in concern right now is palladium. But it's not just palladium, gas, oil, wheat. Because when you combine the production of wheat from Russia and Ukraine, both of them combined are only second to China, which is the largest producer of wheat in the world. So this is going to be a massive crisis that will push inflation out of whack and the pace of growth will slow down dramatically, and hence the stagflation crisis. It's going to revolve once again around palladium, because as you can see, 41% of the palladium is mined in Russia, 39 in South Africa, 13% in North America, meaning Canada, which the way it's going right now, being a dictatorship and all, we might have to bomb it and just steal the palladium. But anyways, then we have 8% from others. Here's the problem. If the Russian supply is disrupted or we have sanctions on exports of palladium, the South African output is not going to cover that because as you can see, the South African output of palladium has been declining while the Russian output has been holding steady. What are the implications if palladium prices surge out of whack? And folks, we're not even talking about oil and gas because you're already familiar with that story. But when it comes to palladium, it's going to hit the semiconductor industry hard. The chips industry is already suffering from major shortages, major inflation in prices, but the demand remains so high that these chips manufacturers have a pricing power. Will they enjoy the pricing power when the demand goes down and palladium prices surge even higher? I doubt it. On top of that, Palladium goes into the production of catalytic converters. What does that mean? The input cost for manufacturers, the likes of GM, Ford, all of them, they will get hit really hard and they will have to pass the extra cost to the end consumer. Look at used car prices surging out of whack. Look at new cars prices surging out of whack due to the shortages and the inflation in materials that we already have. Can you imagine what a doubling in the price of palladium would do to the automotive industry? You gotta think about it. Now, let's segue to stagflation and the warning from Mohamed Alarian. Here he is once again. Hey, Mohamed, if the situation does escalate, you could very easily get uh, oil prices well over $100 a barrel, gas prices 5 to $6 a pop. Is that recession worthy for this year? It would certainly, as I said, have the stagflationary wind. Um, is it does it mean recession automatically? I don't think so. Um, certainly not for the United States. It will be more problematic for Europe because it also gets supply disruptions on top of the price hit. But I think for the United States, don't underestimate um, the resilience of the U.S. economy. I think the biggest risk to the U.S. economy is a Fed policy mistake. That, that is the biggest risk. Now, Mohammed thinks that the U.S. economy is still steady, holding steady. It is strong enough to avoid the stagflation crisis, at least for now. But European economies will not. They will hit stagflation right away. And by the way, I've been warning you about the German economy, that it will be the first economy, the first European economy to hit stagflation and perhaps recession. Why? Inflation is surging higher. The GDP of Germany depends on manufacturing, specifically automotive manufacturing. Now, with all of these shortages and the increase in palladium prices, the automotive production from Germany will get hit hard. And hence, it is the first economy that is hitting stagflation the first major economy of course a matter of fact today we got producer prices from germany and folks it's not good it's just not good this is really alarming german producer prices rose in january at their fastest rate since modern records began soaring 25 percent and extending a run of sharp increases likely to keep businesses under financial stress and consumer inflation high the jump in factory gate costs considered leading indicator for consumer prices here in the u.s we have the ppi which is a leading indicator for the cpi the last ppi reading was above nine percent anyways was the biggest since 1949 
Wow, when West and East Germany were founded and the country's post-war economic data series began. Now, let's debate Mohamed Alarian's call that the US economy will hold. It's not going to fall into stagflation. The problem is, we're already at the threat of stagflation. The moment the pace of economic growth gets hit, and it will get hit when the Fed increases interest rates, you combine that with the fact that inflation is so high and sticky. I disagree with Mohamed Alarian. I think we will hit stagflation too and eventually recession. Look at the prices of everyday goods that American consumers use. When we talk about Kimberly Clark Kleenex tissues, that is 16.4% inflation year over year. When you talk about sweet peas, for example, 15%. Butter popcorn, that's up 13%. And by the way, you're going to need a lot of popcorn with this freak show. Pringles, up almost 13%. Diapers, you're going to need a lot of those too. That's almost 10%. Cereal, 8.1%. Meanwhile, the CPLI says inflation at 7.5%. Folks, it's getting bad out there. It is almost impossible to see this inflation going down this year. It's going to take a long time. And most importantly, an aggressive policy from the Fed. And hence, stagflation is perhaps already here. Look at car prices. That goes hand in hand with the conversation about palladium inflation. The headline reads, most new car buyers are buying over sticker price, especially on certain brands. For example, the markup for Cadillacs is over $4,000 year over year. Land Rovers, almost $2,500. You might say, hey, who's going to buy Cadillacs and Land Rovers right now? I could only afford a Kia. For prices of Kias, the markup is over $2,200. Honda, 1500 bucks. Hyundai, 1500 bucks too. And that is, of course, assuming that you can find new cars. In this environment, it's pretty much impossible to find new cars. So we're sticking to used cars for now. The prices of used cars are surging out of whack to unbelievable and perhaps comical levels. The headline reads Price hikes on cars could be here to stay thanks to the thing. And let me fix this one for you. There is no thing here. How bad thanks to the cocaine? A Dodge Grand Caravan, the minivan from Dodge, in January 2021, the value was 15227 bucks. The value in January 2022 went higher to 25789 bucks. That is an increase of 69%. Unbelievable. You look at a Nissan Versa, for example, the price of that particular vehicle was 9842 bucks back in January of 2021. The price of the same vehicle, by the way, went higher this January of 2022 to 16366 bucks. That is a markup of 66%. And it goes on and on and on, as you can see from this list. Companies are raising prices across the board. Pretty much every single earnings that we listen to this earnings season, every single company is saying inflation is killing us. So we have to continue to increase prices over and over and over again. Shake Shack increasing prices by nearly 7%. The prices of McDonald's are up 40%. The prices of Big Macs are going higher. I noticed that the patties are shrinking, the buns are shrinking, even for the Kardashians last time I checked. Anyways, we talk about truckers. Everybody's demonizing truckers right now. They're going as far as calling them terrorists. These were the heroes in 2020. Truckers are the backbone of this country, the backbone of Canada, the backbone of any country. Without them, the economy gets paralyzed immediately. And truckers are not happy. Unfortunately, they're getting crushed and beaten when they protest the working conditions and the low pay that they have to go through. Last year, trucking companies in the United States suffered a deficit of 80,000 drivers, according to data from the American Trucking Associations. The Trade Association also estimates that about 72% of America's freight transport moves by trucks, which shows just how dependent consumers are on drivers to deliver goods. All of you bad and truckers out there, let's see how you're going to hold sitting on your ass ordering goods online when there are no truckers to deliver these goods. Continuing. But amid low pay and less than desirable working conditions, many are leaving the industry in search for better opportunities. Meanwhile, drivers' pay has been cut from an adjusted median of 110000 bucks in 1980 to just 47130 bucks in 2020. This is outrageous. It's a crime. No wonder why truckers are quitting and protesting. Another phenomenon from this inflation is price gouging. Now, as an investor, you want to be with companies that are practicing price gouging, and the consumer, the zombie consumer, is receptive. As a consumer, you want to do the opposite. You want to boycott companies that are practicing price gouging and shrinkflation. 
But as an investor, you don't have another choice but to stick with these companies until the consumer collectively wakes up. You look at companies like Kimberly Clark, for example, their margins are down 20% year over year. Do you want to be with this company or do you want to be with Molson Coors, for example, where the margins are up 307% year over year? Procter & Gamble, 177.5% year over year. Tyson Foods, another name that I've been talking about in this channel for a while. The margins for Tyson are up 64% year over year. Arca Daniels, another name I've been recommending to you over and over and over again. The ticker ADM, margins are up 50%. You can see the list here. Companies that are improving their margins in this inflation, these are the companies you want to stick with as an investor, perhaps not as a consumer. Now, when we talk about energy prices, the inflation in energy prices, specifically crude oil, gasoline prices. The conflict between Russia and Ukraine makes things worse. We were already absent of the conflict. We were hearing calls of a 100 bucks a barrel, perhaps 150 a barrel by this summer. Add the conflict and now you're adding fuel to the fire to push crude oil prices higher. Perhaps we will see 150 because with everything going on right now, this call doesn't sound as crazy as it did perhaps a few months ago. The Biden administration is now begging the Saudis to produce more oil. Why? Because the administration is desperate right now as we head closer to the elections. If inflation sticks and the consumer is paying these crazy prices at the pump, we're seeing calls for seven bucks a gallon at the pump. If that happens, do you think the consumer is going to vote for the Democrats or for Biden again? Of course not. This is becoming a political crisis for the Democrats. And hence, the Biden administration is begging the Saudis for more barrels to be pumped. Now, the Saudis are saying to Biden, get lost. We're not going to pump more. The economy is booming in Saudi Arabia right now. Why would the Saudis be interested in lower prices right now and destroy the economic growth and gains that they scored in the last two years? Matter of fact, the oil minister is saying we got to keep building the consensus within OPEC plus members. And I'm quoting now, the minister says we need to keep this consensus building approach to be with us permanently, because without it, we will lose sight of our collective ambition. The Saudi energy minister, Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman, said at energy conference in Riyadh Sunday. He also added, ask any producer of oil and gas today, if it were not for OPEC+, Plus, would they be the chairman and CEOs of today? And the answer, they would have vanished. In other words, the Saudis are saying, we're not going to change this policy. We want higher prices. And by the way, higher oil prices are good for your companies, meaning American, British, European companies, doesn't matter. Look at the share price of Exxon, Chevron, British Petroleum, all the smaller oil and gas producers, Devon, Pioneer. All of these stock prices are surging higher. These companies are flush with cash once again. They were on the brink of bankruptcy just two years ago. Now they're flush with cash. They're increasing dividends. They're issuing buybacks. These are the kind of stocks you want to stick with right now because they're thriving. The largest producer of oil in the world says we're not going to change policy. We want higher prices. There is no incentive whatsoever for us to reduce prices at this point. Now, you might be shitting your pants. Inflation is going to go higher. Oil prices are going to go higher. I'm going to pay seven, eight bucks a barrel at the gas pump. What's with the FUD, bro? Calm down, I got some good news and optimism for you. Take, for example, uh, Hungary's prime minister or president, I'm not sure what he is, but he says he hopes inflation will dip below 6% by year end. Hope and prayers. That could be a strategy. Or you could be delusional altogether, like the IMF. The IMF still today, they see or they say they see a significant risk, but eyes gradual moderation in rising prices. All of this garbage, the delusion from the IMF, but specifically from the Fed, will lead this economy to the gates of hell. I'm channeling my inner Mike Wilson now. Let's continue with Mohammed Al Aryan because he says that the only thing that will push this economy, meaning the US economy, to stagflation and then recession is an error in the Fed's policy. Take a listen. The conflict itself, if it were to get worse, which is a big if, but if it were to get worse, would blow a very strong stagflationary wind through the global economy. So that factor is something that the markets are keeping an eye on. But there's also something else, as you rightly point out. We have lost our most important anchor. For a very long time, this market had the anchor of a very accommodating liquidity regime. 
inflation changes all that. We can no longer depend and rely and predict massive injections by the Federal Reserve. And once you take that anchor away, you're left with a corporate um, earnings anchor. And that one is significant. That's why actually markets have behaved relatively well, but it's nothing like the bigger one that has gone away, which is this continued injection of liquidity. The Fed error, by the way, it's going to happen. It is inevitable at this point. What are they going to do? They're pinned between a rock and a hard place. You don't raise interest rates higher. Right now, you risk higher inflation, perhaps hyperinflation or stagflation. And then sooner or later, you're going to have to slam on the brakes even harder and push this economy into a recession or even a depression. If they start slamming the brakes right now, meaning in March, by 50 basis points or more, then the stock market is going to crash. 20, 30 percent, we're going to lose jobs. We're going to see a dramatic slowdown in the pace of economic activities. It is a lose-lose situation right now. And even investor David Einhorn has been holding banks for a long time now. But perhaps now it is his time. He says the speculative market bubble peaked last year and warns the Fed may struggle to curb inflation. Folks, it's getting bad out there. We're seeing stocks crashing 70, 80, 90 percent. Sooner or later, they're going to hit the big caps. Apples, Microsofts, Google, etc. The indices will get hit. It is inevitable now. Now, while Arian says, I don't see the U.S. economy hitting recession right away, it is more resilient. The problem is, you look at the yield curve, we're getting closer and closer and closer to an inversion in the yield curve. And this has been always, always a reliable indicator that we are heading to a recession in the next year. As you can see, the stock market, all the indices are down big. In the case of the Nasdaq, double digits down. And as the saying goes, as January goes, so will the year. But there is hope here that perhaps Mohamed al is right that the U.S. economy is resilient and it will face stagflation and perhaps a recession with resiliency. The problem is the resiliency is limited within the big caps, certain names in the stock market, the biggest technology companies and the likes. When we look at the cash equivalent per share, we're pretty much at the highest level ever. What does that mean? A company like Apple has hundreds of billions of dollars worth of cash. A company like Berkshire Hathaway also has tens of billions of dollars worth of cash sitting on the sidelines. The net debt to EBITDA ratio for the S&P 500 is pretty much at historic lows. This is a good sign that we have healthy companies in the market. Really strong balance sheets. The problem is, if the entirety of the economy gets hit by a Fed error, a mistake, and the mistake is inevitable right now, the economy will slow down dramatically, meaning the revenues, the profits for these companies will get hit really hard, meaning their stocks will also get hit really hard. And now they will go into capital preservation mode by laying off employees. You know the deal. The good news is, for some of these companies, the likes of Apple, for example, or let's say certain banks, the large banks at least, is the fact that they have plenty of cash. They don't have a lot of debt. So these are the companies that you want to identify and buy later on after the stock market crashes. You don't want to buy them right now because they will go down either way if we have an event where the economy gets hit hard by a Federal Reserve mistake. And again, the mistake at this point is inevitable. Now, you combine that with the fact that corporate earnings are peaking, as I've been telling you for a while now. The expected growth for earnings is going to slow down dramatically. For now, they say that corporate earnings will remain positive, but off the peak, meaning stocks will also be off the peak. And this is, by the way, for now. If the economy starts to sour in the next few months, these estimates will go down, perhaps to negative. We will continue to track these estimates. Once they go to negative, run for the hills. Now, the good news for market bulls, or perhaps bad news, hear me out, the estimates for a rate hike in March actually went down. So as you can see, post the CPI, the estimate went higher, and then February 17th, last Thursday, the estimate went down. Now, this could be the result of various reasons. Number one, certain dovish talk from other Fed members to counter the narrative from Bullard. Number two, it could be the fact that the market is seeing a slowdown in the economy. That the economy is stagnating. We're seeing a lot of macro data, for example, looking really bad. For now, they're brushing that off, but it is due to the Pokemon variant. But we're about to get a new batch of data in this week. And if we're still seeing a slowdown in the macro picture, stagnation, then you cannot use the Pokemon as an excuse anymore. And we have a bigger problem here. The economy is perhaps slowing down dramatically 
quickly, and the Fed will not have to increase interest rates by a lot. The 50 basis points will go down to 25 basis points. The bulls might get excited, so we should buy the dip, right? The problem is, you forgot about what I just said. The economy is stagnating. If that is the reason behind downgrading the estimates from 50 basis points to now 35 basis points, if the reason behind that is an economy that is stagnating, that is not a good reason to buy the dip. And again, the estimates for rate hikes went down last week for both the Fed and the ECB. Not for the good reasons, by the way, that inflation is cooling down on its own, aka transitory. These estimates are going down for the bad reasons that economies are stagnating. Oh, by the way, we might have a war between Russia and Ukraine. Another alarming piece of data, the change in the two-year government bond yields in the past three months is still lagging, way lagging the estimate and the forecast for inflation over the past three months. What does that mean? If everything holds right now, the two-year should continue to surge higher, signaling more interest rate hikes to come, more inflation to come. And the gap between the change in the two-year government bond yields and the forecast for inflation is so wide, specifically in the European zone. There's a lot of catching up here. Things could get ugly really, really fast. Even the criminals at JP Morgan are now estimating perhaps nine hikes, 25 basis points for each meeting. We'll get nine of those. Remember what happened back in 2018 when the Fed announced the autopilot policy? The market went down 20% instantly. If this is announced in March that the Fed will perhaps increase interest rates by 25 basis points, not 50, but the increases will happen every single meeting until the data improves, it's not going to be good news for the stock market. I don't see it that way. But what's going on with the Fed zombies, by the way? Well, we have an update. Now, after the criminals got exposed, they have new rules to ban stocks and crypto trading by Fed officials. I say too little, too late. But let's contrast the hawks versus the doves. The leader of the hawks right now is James Bullard. And Bullard is not backing off here. He is sticking and doubling down. Matter of fact, he says there is too much focus on the notion that inflation will dissipate. And it's not. Meaning, the Fed needs the aggressive shock and all policy. We have another one. Mr. Who used to be a dove, now maybe a little hawkish. Now she says rates should rise faster than after the Great Recession. Another hawk. Fed Governor Brownman, who supported the 50 basis points hike right off the gate, comes Marsh. Now let's talk about the doves. When we talk about the doves, let's talk about the king of doves, New York Fed President Williams, who says he backs the Marsh rate hikes. He did not specify 25 or 50 basis points. My assumption is 25 basis points. But he says the asset sales, the balance sheet, should happen later this year. Quote unquote. Another dove, the demon from Minneapolis, Kashkari. And this is the most delusional, by the way. Even Williams says we should increase interest rates comes Marsh. But this delusional madman, Kashkari, he says that inflation will slow down markedly this year. And I say Kashkari, maybe, but it will slow down for the bad reasons. These reasons are the economy is getting crushed. Another delusional madman, Chicago Fed President Evans, who's in the camps of the doves. He says their policy, the transitory policy, was wrong-footed, but may not need to be restrictive. Meaning, uh, please don't crash the stock market. I did not sell yet. And this indecisive action by the Fed, the delusion, the irresponsibility, the recklessness, and the divide, the lack of consensus between the doves and the hawks, is causing a lot of volatility in the stock market. Take a look at the contrast between the one to two year to one to 30 year volatility. When you pin them against each other, the higher the reading, it means the volatility will surge higher in the short run, not in the long run. And we're now reaching levels that we have not seen since the financial crisis. This is not a good read for the stock market, meaning we are already seeing, and we will continue to see, unbelievable volatility. I mean, you see the market today, it's impossible to trade it. Matter of fact, if you're trading the market, the day traders, they're getting killed. Intraday traders, the followers of intraday trends, have done poorly in the last two years, but specifically in 2022. Because you buy the dip, for example, you follow certain technical indicators, oversold, overbought, you buy the dip, you get smoked right away the very next day. You short, for example, you think, okay, maybe the market's going down, you short, based on the technicals, maybe there is resistance, whatever. And here comes the dovish talk from the Fed, or good news on the Russia-Ukraine front. You get smoked right away. It is pretty much impossible to trade the stock market right now, given this insane volatility. We love volatility, but not this much. So you got to have a longer horizon strategy here. 
And better yet, you're going to have a hedging strategy even on your trades. With that, folks, we're going to move on here and cover the market information for you. We start with the indices' performances last week, and here we go. On Friday, the Dow Industrial Average was down 232.85 points, or a decline of 0.68%. The Nasdaq down 168.65 points, or a decline of 1.23%. The S&P 500 down 31.39 points, or a decline of 0.78%. 72%, excuse me. What about the sector's performance for the day on Friday? Shame on all of them. We're not going to give any medals here because every single sector almost closed in the red. We have defensives in the green, not by a lot, barely. Yet the laggards were led by communication services, technology, and cyclicals. Let's contrast this with the performance for the week. No different here. The leader capturing the gold, silver, and bronze is consumer defensives. Materials barely in the green. But the laggards once again, this time around, led by energy, communication services, and technology. You can see the theme, at least for last week. The theme was the search for yields. The search for the pricing power. Yields, pricing power, is in the hands of consumer defensives, the staples, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, Mondelez, etc. What about the advance to decline ratios? NYSE, 31% advancing versus 66% declining. The NASDAQ, 29% advancing versus 66% declining. Moving on to commodities, futures. This is the map from today's activities. We're not seeing Friday's activities because it's irrelevant now. There was a lot of action going on in the futures market. The stock market market was closed, not the futures market. Look at what happened with crude oil prices. Unbelievable. A massive surge higher. A gain of almost 3% apiece for both the WTI and Brent. It is just a matter of time now before we see a hundred handle on the Brent. It could happen by the end of the week if we have an invasion. Likewise, gasoline was up almost 3% today. Heating oil up over 2.5%, natural gas surging and gaining over 5% in today's session. Softs, we're seeing losses here, led by coffee, lumber, cocoa, and sugar. Yet the laggard for the year in softs is leading the gains. OJ up almost 2%, followed by cotton, gaining a little over one and a quarter percent. What about metals? Muted action across the board, be it gold, be it silver, be it platinum, be it copper, copper down by a little more than the rest. But look at palladium. All eyes on palladium right now. Palladium surged higher by a little over two percent in today's session. Meats, modest losses for live and fetal cattle futures. But look at this, the new big tech. Lean hogs continues to move higher with no stop in sight here, folks, gaining another almost 1.5% today. Grains, we have losses for oats, big ones, over 2% today, followed by soybean meal and wheat. It will be interesting to see how wheat futures are going to react tomorrow because, once again, the production between Russia and Ukraine, you combine both of them together, you have the second largest producer of wheat in the world. We're talking about bread here. These prices surge higher. Welcome to the starvation crisis, folks. Yet today we saw gains for soybeans, soybean oil, corn, canola, all moving higher, while rough rice pretty much in the flat line. I have a lot of commodities news for you, but we're running out of time. So I'm going to cut it short here and share this news with you in tomorrow's video. Moving on to options, the big casino. What happened on Friday? The hottest table by far remains Apple. And look at the volume, surged higher, significantly higher for Apple. Something is going on here. Apple came at number one with a little over 2 million contracts traded hands on Friday. About 52% of those were calls. Tesla, the souffle, at number two with almost 900,000 contracts traded on Friday. About 47.5% of those were calls. They're buying more puts than calls. Tesla is about to break up. AMD at number three with a little over 600,000 contracts. 54.5% of those were calls. What about the unusual activities? that took place in the casino on Friday. We start with SPY for the S&P 500. A massive trade here. They're buying the 395 puts for the expiration date April 1st with expectations that the name could drop down by more than 9% by then. They paid about 4 bucks and 75 cents apiece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $17 million. What about the trades for the ticker? ROKU for Roku. Down big last week. They're betting for more declines to come. By opening a put spread here, 
buying the 100 puts and selling the 90 puts all for the expiration date February 25th with the expectations that Roku could drop down by more than 11% by then but not more than 20%. They paid about 1 buck and 75 cents a piece to enter this trade with 100 bucks puts and they received about 55 bucks from selling the 90 puts. All in all they paid about 1 buck and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about 1.4 million dollars. What about the trades for the ticker MGM for you guessed it MGM this is a strangled trade meaning the trader is not sure whether MGM is going to pop higher or drop down but they're sure there is a massive move coming in MGM double digit move so they're buying upside calls they're also buying downside puts in this case they bought the 48 calls for the expiration date May 20th they also bought the 38 puts for the same expiration date May 20th they paid about two bucks and 20 cents a piece for buying the 48 calls and they also paid about one buck and 85 cents a piece all in all they spent about four bucks a piece and that brings the total to about three and a half million dollars this is an important trade for the ticker smh the semiconductor etf when we talk about palladium the increase in prices for palladium that goes hand in hand with the decline in the smh they're buying the 235 puts for the expiration date april 14th with the expectations that the smh could drop down by more than 11 and percent by then and they paid about six bucks and a half a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about five and a half million dollars and lastly at the bottom of the table what about the ticker gm for general motors the buying calls here i disagree if palladium prices are going to move higher you want a short GM, but perhaps the name is oversold by now. They're betting for a bounce because they bought the 52 and a half calls for the expiration date April 14th with expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 8% by then. And they paid about one buck and 70 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about one million dollars moving on to the heat map this is the heat map from friday and as you can see bloodbath across the board with few exceptions cisco remains a hot name on the heels of earnings this is a value name some of the chip names amd rebounded higher amd got hit really hard throughout the week we're seeing some short covering here some of the banks also moved higher jp morgan the regional banks likewise ford really oversold we're seeing some short covering here that moved higher the staples we talked about the ad performance from staples coca-cola pepsico unilever kimberly clarks kellogg all holding on friday's session but as you can see industrials down big even energy down the chinese names did not hold the pump for the kathy wood names did not hold everything got sold right away tesla down big even deer after reporting earnings crushed earnings but the ticker de is down big on friday the control of the market right now is the news regarding Russia Ukraine and oh by the way on top of that the Fed's hawkish policy let's contrast this with the heat map for the week and as you can see it gets a little brighter the chip names forget about Nvidia Nvidia has been running really hot but the value chip names outperformed Cisco is the winner of course in technology the big pharma names held pretty good the high dividend names specifically AbV closed the week with gains of almost one and a half percent that goes hand in hand with the theme of searching for dividends in consumer staples Coca-Cola up Procter & Gamble up Walmart was up the tobacco names high dividends still the ad performers but we're seeing energy getting hit banks getting hit healthcare getting hit even the big cap technology stocks are starting to fade here facebook already faded facebook waved the white flag who's next now is it going to be google is it going to be microsoft apple amazon one of them will be the next to fall another name that bucked the trend this week and closed in the green is the ticker unp for railroads and industrials this is one of the names that i've been recommending for you for a while as an inflationary hedge because it doesn't matter if you need to transport goods they're going to charge you more you have no other choice they have the pricing power for now we're also seeing an ad performance from gold gold miners are big throughout the week on the heels of the russia ukraine tensions now let's contrast all of this with the year to date heat map as you can see technology down big all the high beta high multiple names getting absolutely smashed but there are corners in this market that are still working by looking at the heat map from a bird's eye view you can see that energy is the clear winner but you can dig down and find certain names for example within auto manufacturers honda a name i've been cheering for since the beginning of the year and the only name that i added to my portfolio the ticker hmc 
is up about 12% year to date. Another name is the ticker ADM and TSN Tyson Arca Daniels. These are two names that I've been recommending for you for a while. Both names are up year to date big time. Another ad performer is the fertilizer section of the market, specifically Mosaic, MOS, up over 14.5% for the year. I've been a cheerleader for fertilizer stocks for a while now. The ticker AA, Alcoa, Aluminum. Look at these gains. Over 31% gains year to date. So there are corners that are working, folks. Another name, the ticker OC, Owens Corning. I covered the chart in the fourth quarter of last year and I told you this is a name that I'm eyeing and I bought options, call options, to add it to my portfolio. Well, guess what? Owens Corning is up over 8% year to date. It reported earnings this week, last week I should say, and the earnings are good, but you're starting to see that inflation is eating away their margins. So they have to continue to increase prices on home builders. Now, will home builders perform when we see a slowdown in the demand in this economy? That remains to be seen. Another corner that is still working in the stock market is defense contractors. Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, both are up over 8% for the year. My pick was Raytheon, RTX. As you can see, the name is up almost 8.5% for the year. So there are corners, folks. There are names that are still working, but there are very few of them. And once again, this is a picker's market, not a blindfold, let's buy an ETF kind of market. Moving on to charts, and we start with SPY, the S&P 500, 30 minutes chart. It's a meltdown at this point, and we stopped at around 434. In all likelihood, this is not going to hold. you got to retest the line in the sand at 430, Looking at the futures right now, we've already breached below 430. The question right now is, can the SPY recaptures 430 as support by the end of the day? Besides that, folks, it's going to get really, really ugly and fast. So I am eyeing 430 as resistance this time around, because if the futures open as they're showing, we're going to be already below that number. Let's look at the futures right away. As you can see, the importance of this chart is, after the pump, the Macron pump overnight yesterday, Look at where the chart went. This is really important. It went all the way to retest the highs of the previous candle. It went all the way to retest 4,384 and a half. And it failed so far. It's a miserable failure. So for now, we're looking at the support at around 4,232. If that doesn't hold, then we're looking way down there for support. And it's not going to look good for the bulls. The bulls are hoping for a double bottom at around 4,232. If that is breached, if we have a close, a daily close below that number, then the market is looking way below for support. Look at the volume. It didn't spike by a lot. So this is still a good sign for the bulls that perhaps there is hope here. You look at the momentum indicators and it doesn't look good for the bulls. The bears are in total charge right now. The momentum indicators are weakening, and once again, the bears remain in full control. Look at the daily chart for the SPX, the cash index. We have a failure of the 200 days moving average, and for now, you gotta go down to catch support. You gotta go down to catch strong support before you rerun a retest at the 200 days moving average. We have two levels here. 4,300, that appears to be already breached, looking at the futures, so we're now looking down at around 4200 let's be a little conservative here and call it 4200 it's a little above that but let's be conservative and say 4200 if that doesn't hold then we're going down to retest 4000 and by then the spx will be really really oversold waiting for any spark to blast higher what about the Qs, the nasdaq 30 minutes chart we've already went down at the line in the sand 343 and failed we closed below that number looking at the futures we're way below that now there is nothing to look at in this chart here it's a flush down it's a meltdown whatever you want to call it we have to look at the daily chart specifically the continuous contract chart and here it is we had the triangle pattern which is now broken to the downside you look at the candle the good news for the bulls is the retest at 13,600 is for now successful, but you're not out of the woods yet. For all you know, the chart could curl down again and breach that support. Then what? We're looking down at 13,300. You see, if the chart keeps the support of 13,600, you can still make the argument for the double bottom that the bulls are waiting for to buy the dip and move this chart a little higher. But you lose that and the double bottom argument goes out of the window. When we look at the volume, it spiked higher on a selling day on Friday. Not a good sign for the bulls, good sign for the bears. Likewise, the momentum indicators are curling down back into negative divergence. Once again, the bears 
in full charge. What about the IWM 30 minutes chart for the Russell 2000? Doing a little better than the SPY in the Qs, but again, it closed the gap and closed the day below the gap. It lost the support of 204 and a half, looking down at 196 and a half for support right now. When we look at the daily chart, excuse me, the weekly chart for the RUT, the Russell 2000, the big one, it is just a matter of time, folks, before that bear flag plays out and we see a flush down and it will be ugly 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 stay away from small caps right now too risky for my taste something gotta change here be it on the russia ukraine front but most importantly on the hawkish fed front moving on the dollar for now it remains a bear flag but we're seeing a bull flag within a bear flag which is not unusual by the way we see these patterns all the time but what it say is the following the dollar could run higher to run a retest at 97 as support yet keeping the overall bearish formation bearish pattern what is the fundamental reason pushing the dollar higher the weakness in the Russian ruble. It plunged dramatically today, pushing the value of the US dollar higher. The dollar was ready to flush down and lose 96 of support, but then you get the news and the Russian ruble crashes, and here we go, the dollar takes a leg higher. Will that stop gold for now? It doesn't appear so. Gold is getting a little overbought for now from a daily chart perspective, and it is, by the way, battling the resistance at around 1900. If the dollar surges higher by a lot, it could dent the rally in gold, but remember, a rally in the US dollar right now will come hand in hand with a crash in the ruble, the Russian ruble. If the Russian ruble crashes, it means we have bad news on the Russia-Ukraine front and this will encourage more flows into gold. So for now, gold has the momentum and the tailwinds to rally higher even with the dollar moving higher. What about a daily chart for the 10-year yield? It lost the support of 1.94. We're now eyeing 1.77 for support. The resiliency is still here because the Fed is becoming hawkish. On the other hand, we have the tug of war, not between Russia and Ukraine, but between the news of Russia-Ukraine versus the news of the hawkish Fed. News of the hawkish Fed pushing this chart higher. News of Russia-Ukraine pushing this chart down. But when you read the psychology of the chart, which catalyst has the upper hand? I would argue it is the hawkish Fed, not Russia-Ukraine. Because if Russia-Ukraine was the dominant catalyst, this chart would have flushed down all the way to 1.77 in no time. But it's still holding, meaning the hawkish Fed is a strong catalyst to keep this chart afloat and keep it trading higher. What about the TLT weekly chart? It caught a nice bounce off 134.5. We'll see if it can recapture 140 as support. And if that happens, it will be good news for the NASDAQ. Look at the correlation between the TLT and the NASDAQ. TLT in red, NASDAQ Qs in orange. Since around the second quarter of last year, we're seeing a reliable and a high degree of correlation between the two. So if the TLT pops higher, you will see the Qs also rebounding higher. So the TLT could be a leading indicator to watch here. What about the VIX 4 hours chart? This remains a little mysterious for now. It appears that we have bad news in the Russia-Ukraine front. Why isn't the VIX popping higher dramatically? We'll see if it does as we start trading tomorrow, but for now, look at the MACD indicator. It is showing green impressions of the histogram, but it could fall back in the red. So it's a toss-up for now. The fact that we're trading above 20 means that the bears remain in control of the market, but perhaps the bulls are fighting back. If the chart doesn't pop higher, to retest 33 as resistance by tomorrow, if the bad news regarding Russia-Ukraine holds, then perhaps this will be a good sign for the bulls that the market is looking for a bottom. It is desperate for a spark to start a rebound higher. What about the VXN, four hours chart for the VIX for the NASDAQ? Again, you look at the MACD indicator, we're seeing green impressions in the histogram. But again, why isn't the VXN popping higher by a lot when we have such bad news and the futures are down big? Could be the holiday, we'll see how it opens tomorrow, but you gotta watch this one carefully. The resistance will be around 37 and a half, the support, and the most important support, 27 and a half. Moving on to a daily chart for Apple, what's going on here? It ran down, it bounced off the support of the upper band, the upper range of the channel. Yet, it is not a good look for Apple. Look at the volume, it is surging higher. On a down day, the momentum indicators are curling down, producing red impressions on the histogram of the MACD, confirming that we now have bearish momentum. If Apple goes down, back into the channel, will be a bad sign for the entirety of the market because as Apple goes, so will the rest of the market. Now, let's take the bearish bias and see it from the eyes of the bulls because the bulls have an argument here. What if this is, all in all, a bull 
flag consolidation. The chart of Apple is going to pop higher sooner or later. That is still on the table, by the way. So the bulls have a point. The bulls have hope to fight back. We'll see who's going to win at the end. But for now, the bears are slightly in advantage. What about Tesla, the souffle in hourly chart? It closed the week below the trend line. Not a good sign for Tesla bulls. Good sign for Tesla bears. The chart got a little oversold and it bounced off that, but that doesn't merit a run higher to recapture the trend line yet. If it happens, Tesla could run to retest the trend line, but in all likelihood, it's going to face some resistance there and pull back again. When we look at the daily chart, or the weekly chart, excuse me, we can run a trend line like this. And we can argue that the trend line is over, which is a bad sign for Tesla bulls and a shorting sign for the bears. You can play with the line and be a little more bullish with it and perhaps use a longer range. Either way, we are at the trend line right now and the chart appears, at least for now, that it is ready not to bounce from the trend line but to break below it. And that will be an ominous signal for Tesla bulls. When we switch to the monthly chart of Tesla, look at the MACD indicator. It is curling down, about to cross, creating red impressions in the histogram. Not a good sign for Tesla. What if what we're seeing right now is the beginning of a head and shoulder formation, meaning Tesla will bounce right off the 650 levels or so, and then it will create a bull trap rally, and then flush down all the way to trade finally around the 300-400 range. It is entirely possible. But Tesla will be the last block to fall, by the way. What about Tulips? BTC lost all of the momentum. Notice that it was a bear trap, the bear flag at around 35,750. It trapped a lot of bears, producing that pop higher. And then we saw a crack above 42,000, a retest of 42,000, and a successful bounce higher. And that was a bull trap, which is very frustrating for technical traders of this chart. The support of 42,000 is lost now. We have a double top formation. We have to see a retest of 35,750 before we buy this chart again. Lastly, what about AMC, an hourly chart? Again, we saw a failure to retest 21 on Friday, but all in all, the hope is still intact. The chart has what it takes to run a retest at 21 as resistance, at least for now. If it opens down tomorrow, and we see it trading around 14 to 15, then forget about the retest. If anything, we're running a retest at the support, 14, 13 and a half, and that's not going to hold. Moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the very important S&P K chiller home price index and then we have the manufacturing pmi along with the services pmi and lastly the consumer confidence index all important indicators a critically important day tomorrow an important week buckle up your seat belts but this is all i got for you for now folks thank you for listening thank you for watching i will talk to you again tomorrow